Brene Brown begins her book by clearly stating, within the therapy narrative, that she hates the feeling of vulnerability. She goes on to write that some of the things making her feel most vulnerable are fear, anxiety, trying new things, worrying about how others may perceive or judge her, and generally fear of the unknown. These are all common feelings that come with vulnerability that her readers are sure to relate to. One of Brown's quotes neatly sums up her feelings. Keep everyone at a safe distance and always have an exit strategy. This is a typical thought pattern for people with anxiety and those who feel uncomfortable when they are vulnerable. While Brown was, for most of her life, uncomfortable whenever she felt vulnerable, she also knew that she was a loving and empathetic person. These personality traits are, in part, what encouraged her to pursue a career in social work, along with a bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. At the same time, Brown knew that working in the field of social work would mean she would have to be vulnerable and work with people who were in vulnerable situations. She says, Social work is all about leaning into the discomfort of ambiguity and uncertainty and holding open an empathetic space so people can find their own way. During her university years and her career, one of Brown's primary areas of research was connection and why people so desperately crave meaningful connections with others. Over the years, Brown noticed that most of her clients would relate feelings of connection to the world around them and others in the world to their own interpersonal relationships and the emotional experiences they had within these relationships. However, the average client would not talk about their relationships in terms of what they gained from it, happiness, companionship, etc., but instead in terms of what they were lacking. Brown writes, We humans have a tendency to define things by what they are not. By researching the human connection, Brown states that she accidentally began researching how people deal with the opposite feelings of shame and empathy. Brown researched this for about six years before she was able to define shame and outline a method of how to combat it. During her research, Brown challenged herself to find the difference between people who were resilient to shame and those who often felt feelings of shame associated with vulnerability. This challenging thought helped her to create her 10 guideposts for wholehearted living, which are listed, summarized, here. 1. Be authentic. 2. Learn self-compassion. 3. Become resilient. 4. Practice gratitude. 5. Trust your intuition. 6. Don't compare yourself to others. 7. Balance work and play. 8. Let go of anxiety. 9. Let go of self-doubt. 10. Let loose and surrender total control. After writing her guideposts of wholehearted living, Brown realized that she herself only followed two of the goalposts. However, she believes that to live wholeheartedly, one must learn to live by all ten goalposts, which is something she personally had to work on. To further define wholehearted living, Brown writes, Wholehearted living is about engaging in our lives from a place of worthiness. To feel worthy, people need to dare themselves to be courageous and compassionate. They must accept that no human is perfect, and yet we are all worthy of love and acceptance. We, as humans, just need to believe that we are actually worthy if we are to feel more comfortable with vulnerability. In addition to her 10 goalposts, Brown also has five fundamental ideals. These ideals are what helped Brown to come up with her definition of wholehearted living. The ideals are summarized here. 1. Everyone needs to feel loved. 2. People must believe they are worthy of love in order to feel loved. 3. Feeling worthy of love takes practice. 4. People who live wholeheartedly also live courageous and compassionate lives. 5. People must be willing to feel vulnerable in order to feel worthy of love. What does all this sum up to? Brown wants her readers to embrace vulnerability, no matter how awkward or uncomfortable it will likely be at first. She writes, Vulnerability is the core, the heart, 
the center of meaningful human experiences. Without vulnerability, we cannot create meaningful connections with others. Without these connections, it is not likely that one can live life wholeheartedly. Along with embracing vulnerability, Brown wants her readers to dare greatly. One example of daring greatly she gives from her own life comes from a TED Talk she gave in 2010 on the topic of vulnerability, which, of course, made her feel vulnerable to do. However, the talk paid off and became one of the most watched TED Talks online. In 2011, this prompted her to give similar talks for a variety of organizations. By opening up to vulnerability, by giving that initial TED Talk, Brown was encouraged to share her work. While giving her talks to organizations, usually in business settings, Brown noticed that being vulnerable and daring greatly applies to everyone, business people, parents, teachers, etc. In any environment, people will work and connect better if their creativity and innovations are encouraged. People need positive feedback to make their work and lifestyle feel meaningful. This works in a cycle, encouraging passion and hard work. On the flip side, trying to motivate employees, parents, or students with shame, pointing out mistakes rather than celebrating success, doesn't work nearly as well when trying to get positive results. For this reason, it's best to toss shame out the window and embrace positivity. Brown ends her introduction by reiterating that no one is perfect. All one can do is their best. When one fails, they need to pick themselves back up if they ever want a chance at success. She says, what we know matters, but who we are matters more. People need to understand who they are, what their obstacles to success are, what their goals are, and what they need to do in order to accomplish their goals. Once one does these things, they can move forward and get a little closer to living their life wholeheartedly, embracing vulnerability and daring greatly. Narcissism, Scarcity, and Vulnerability No one wants to feel afraid in their daily lives. Indeed, it would feel much better to be filled with feelings of bravery rather than fear. Whether we want to admit it or not, Fear impacts everyone, every day, in one way or another. Narcissism is just another product of this fear. Brown begins by asking if people are narcissists nowadays or not. At first glance, that seems to be the case. Most people look at narcissists in a negative light. However, while many people claim that there are more narcissists now than there used to be in the decades before social media, no one wants to claim the title of narcissist for themselves. Is there a way to cure narcissism? Brown suggests that most people see cutting down narcissists, whether it be by undercutting their accomplishments or otherwise belittling them, as one way to combat their narcissistic nature. However, Brown also suggests that narcissism is caused by shame. If this is true then shaming narcissists even more will only aggravate their narcissistic traits. That leaves the question, what is the real cure for narcissism? Narcissism and Vulnerability No one is born a narcissist. It's not a genetic condition. Instead, narcissism is a learned personality trait and can be influenced by the environment a person grows up in or lives in. A person is not inherently narcissistic. Instead, their narcissism is caused by their choices. Since narcissism is a learned trait and caused directly by the choices one makes, it can be treated and cured. When looking at narcissism under a lens of vulnerability, it becomes a little more nuanced. Under this light, Brown writes that narcissism is a shame-based fear of being ordinary. Narcissistic people tend to brag about their accomplishments, friends, and money, whether any of those things are actually impressive or not. Narcissistic people do this because they feel the need to prove their worth to others. They feel like they need to be extraordinary to be worthy of love. Narcissism is also driven by comparison. In the United States and much of the world at large, there is a culture of us versus them. 
people are constantly comparing themselves to people they know or even people they don't know, like celebrities. With the rise of television personalities, other celebrities, and social media in past decades, it becomes all too easy for people to compare themselves to others. Brown also poses a few key questions for her readers to consider. These, paraphrased, are listed here. 1. How does our culture, environment, society influence our behavior? 2. Do our behaviors, struggles, work to protect ourselves? 3. How are our thoughts and actions related to our feelings of worth? So, are people more narcissistic now than they used to be? It's quite possible. However, it's also possible that people are simply feeling more vulnerable and pressured to be extraordinary to feel deserving of love and acceptance. Artificial Scarcity As mentioned previously, part of the reason why people often feel vulnerable is because they compare themselves to others. When one does this, it's easy to focus on the things or traits that they are lacking in, rather than in the traits and things that they do possess. Brown writes, We get scarcity because we live it. Every day we are faced with thinking about what we do and don't have. More often than not, people shift the focus on the don't rather than the do. One of the best ways to combat the artificial scarcity in life is for one to stop comparing themselves to others. Sometimes, we aren't just comparing ourselves to others, but to our past selves. This can be just as damaging to our self-confidence and feelings of worthiness as comparing ourselves to others. For this reason, it's best to end all comparisons and be thankful for what we have, rather than focusing on what we don't have. However, this is not always as easy as it sounds. Understanding Scarcity Is there scarcity in our lives, or are we making something out of nothing? Brown writes, Worrying about scarcity is our culture's version of post-traumatic stress. Along with literal wars abroad and the lesser wars in our own lives, it's no surprise that many people feel angry and scared much of the time. This fear and anger, in turn, produces shame, comparison, and disengagement. Brown calls these three products the three components of scarcity. Shame is the first component of scarcity. People feel shame for a variety of reasons. Some of the reasons for feeling shame that Brown lists include a fear of ridicule, tying one's self-worth to how productive they are, at work or in the home, and their own feelings of perfectionism. A major theme in Brown's book is that no one is perfect and thinking otherwise will do more harm than good for one's self-esteem. As for external factors dealing with shame, Brown also mentions that getting called names or slurs can also make someone feel ashamed, even though it is not their fault that someone else is choosing to be cruel to them. The second component of scarcity is comparison. Oftentimes, whether it be in work, school, or relationships, people have a habit of comparing themselves to others to ranking their success. This does little to improve one's feelings of self-worth. Instead, this kind of thinking discourages creative thinking. When people compare themselves to others or try to be the best, they are usually aiming at a certain unattainable ideal. Everyone has different goals, so they need to do different things to achieve those goals. Once these goals are completed, the person will likely feel a grand sense of accomplishment. However, if a person gets bogged down in trying to be like someone else, then they will expect their successes, or at least the way they measure success, to be the same, which could be counterproductive to their true goals and what they need to do to live wholeheartedly. The last of the three components of scarcity is disengagement. People become disengaged when they are afraid to try new things or to take risks. They don't want others to think they're weird for trying something different. If a person tries something new, they may be too nervous to share their stories and experiences with others. This creates a struggle for people to express themselves and feel seen and heard. This can result in feelings of isolation, which is anything but conducive to living wholeheartedly. 
Brown wants her readers to know that living wholeheartedly is the opposite of living in scarcity, which is why we should strive for it. However, to live wholeheartedly, it is important to first embrace vulnerability and dare greatly to overcome the components of scarcity. Once one does that, they can move on to living life wholeheartedly. The Four Myths of Vulnerability In this chapter, Brown outlines the four most common myths about vulnerability. These myths are often what hinder people from allowing themselves to feel vulnerable. Once these myths are properly exposed and resolved, one can move on to living their life more wholeheartedly. Myth number one, vulnerability equals weakness. One of the most dangerous things we can believe about vulnerability is that it is the same thing as weakness. Thinking this way only works to hinder the ways we accept and deal with our emotions. In turn, this makes it near impossible to live wholeheartedly. Vulnerability is not a weakness. In fact, vulnerability as a concept is neither inherently good or bad. It's how we perceive vulnerability that decides how it influences our lives. For example, rejecting vulnerability or otherwise ignoring it can lead to feelings for shame, fear, and disappointment. These feelings are entirely unproductive in the goal of living a wholehearted life. However, if we accept and embrace our feelings of vulnerability, it can instead lead to feelings of love, acceptance, bravery, and creativity. All of these feelings inspire us to live a wholehearted life. Brown notes that some people may confuse feeling vulnerability with feelings in general. However, while these two things are often related, they are not the same thing. Related to how feeling vulnerable doesn't equal weakness, feeling emotional also does not equal feeling weak. Emotions come in a range of feelings. Feeling uncomfortable also does not equal weakness. Accepting vulnerability helps to encourage feelings of courage. Only by feeling vulnerable can we be true to ourselves. Brown says, vulnerability is life's great dare. Because of this, the best way to work with our vulnerability to our advantage is to acknowledge and accept it. Myth number two, some people are never vulnerable. Some people may think that they are never vulnerable, which could involve never putting themselves in vulnerable situations or never feeling vulnerable in general. People who think this are kidding themselves. Vulnerability is a part of life. No one can avoid it forever. Brown poses three questions about vulnerability, which are paraphrased here. By answering the below questions, we can better understand how we work with our own vulnerability. 1. What do I do when I feel vulnerable? 2. What do I do when I feel uncomfortable? 3. Am I willing to take emotional risks? Avoiding vulnerability makes it harder for us to grow as people. It makes us live in ways and affects our behavior in such a way that it is counterproductive to living as the kind of person we want to be. Feeling vulnerable isn't a choice. Everyone feels vulnerable sometimes. However, how we react to our vulnerability, by accepting it or avoiding it, is a choice that we actively make each time we feel vulnerable or uncomfortable. Myth number three, vulnerability means sharing everything. Letting people know you feel vulnerable or sharing our vulnerabilities with others isn't the same thing as telling everyone or anyone everything that has ever made us feel insecure. Brown writes, Vulnerability is about sharing our feelings and experiences with people who have earned the right to hear them. Sharing our vulnerabilities is all about building trust with others, not about seeking attention. Vulnerability is not the same thing as oversharing information. Just like with other aspects of relationships, platonic or romantic, having boundaries is extremely important. Brown writes, Vulnerability without boundaries leads to disconnection, distrust, and disengagement. According to Brown, oversharing or having TMI moments with people we are not close to can actually be a form of avoiding genuine vulnerability. This is because oversharing is often used to gain attention, not trust.
It should also be noted that there is a big difference between being vulnerable and using vulnerability or perceived vulnerability to try to make others look a certain way to others. Being vulnerable helps us to live wholeheartedly. Faking vulnerability or using it does not. Humans need to be able to trust someone before we can feel comfortable with being vulnerable with someone. However, building trust usually requires some vulnerability to begin with. This can be a tricky cycle to break into. However, it is often worth the risk. Once we find someone who we can be vulnerable with, we can gain feelings of love and appreciation. Betrayals and disengagement can lessen the trust people have with each other. However, these two things affect trust in different ways. Betrayal often has a dramatic and quick effect on trust. Disengagement, on the other hand, slowly cuts away at trust. Vulnerability opens us up to this risk, but with love, what we have a chance to gain makes it all worth it. Myth number four, we can do it all alone. There is a difference between being alone and feeling lonely. Brown writes that it is okay for people to be alone sometimes, but it's not healthy for humans to isolate themselves from others all of the time. Brown suggests that people are happier when they are vulnerable enough to let others into their lives. When we do this, we open ourselves to feel loved, supported, and trusted. It also allows us to depend on others, trust others, and be vulnerable around others. While this can make us nervous while we are still learning to trust others, it can pay off in the end. To live wholeheartedly, we need to feel loved and supported. Without these feelings, living our best lives can be extremely difficult, especially when it comes to taking risks. Feeling loved and supported makes it easier to dare greatly. Recognizing and Combating Shame Shame and how we deal with it are some of the biggest topics in this book. This chapter focuses on what we can do to combat shame. Brown claims that some of the best things we can do to fight feelings of shame is to talk about it. Vulnerability and Shame Shame creeps into our lives in a variety of ways. It is often difficult to talk about shame. However, if we are to personify shame, then this is exactly what shame wants, for us to avoid talking about it. Trying to avoid talking about difficult topics can sometimes make them seem worse than they actually are. We need to learn how to move past shame if we are to learn how to be vulnerable with both ourselves and with others. Brown writes, If we want to be fully engaged, to be connected, we have to be vulnerable. In order to be vulnerable, we need to develop resistance to shame. One of the best ways to combat shame is to share our thoughts and feelings with others. By doing this, we can live wholeheartedly and be more likely to dare greatly. All too often, people take on the bad habit of correlating their self-worth with how others view their successes, or lack thereof. This can cause one of three basic problems. We stop sharing the things that we are proud of in hearing that others will not approve or otherwise dislike what we have done. This can lead to us having lower amounts of creativity and discourage us on our journey to living wholeheartedly. We do share what we have accomplished and feel crushed when others do not approve or like our work. This also hinders creativity by making us feel like we shouldn't have bothered trying to be creative or do what we like in the first place. People like what we have produced, and we can become trapped in a cycle of living to please others, rather than doing what you want and being creative and living wholeheartedly. All of the above reactions to correlating how others view our accomplishments with our self-worth are bad. While it is okay to care what other people think of what we do, we should try not to tie their approval with our sense of self-worth. When we do this, when people do like what we create, it can still boost our mood. However, when they don't like what we make, it can still disappoint us. Either way, these feelings will be fleeting. What matters is that we had the courage to dare greatly. Ideally, showing this courage will encourage others to do the same, express themselves. 
Having a sense of worthiness encourages us to feel and be more vulnerable with ourselves and others. However, shame works to keep us fearful and hinders our feelings of worthiness. Brown writes, Daring greatly requires worthiness. Without this feeling, we cannot take on the actions, thoughts, and feelings that lead us to be vulnerable and live wholehearted lives. To improve our feelings of worthiness, we need to become resilient to shame. It should be noted that being resilient to shame is not the same as being resistant to shame. No one can be resistant to shame, but anyone, with enough practice, can become resilient to shame. All we have to do is learn how to move past feelings of shame. To do this, we need to learn to be less afraid of failure. Allow yourself to access your feelings of disappointment. Know that you can put yourself out there without things going terribly. Why is shame hard to talk about? Why is shame so hard for people to talk about? Brown writes, Shame is the fear of disconnection. Without feeling connected to others, it can be difficult to feel loved and worthy. As discussed earlier, without these positive feelings, it is nearly impossible to live a wholehearted life. According to Brown, everyone feels shame, whether they want to admit it or not. However, it seems as though no one wants to talk about shame. This is a dangerous practice to get into, as not talking about shame only gives it more power over us. Separating Shame from Embarrassment People often associate shame with several other negative emotions. The primary emotions which are often confused with shame that Brown points out are embarrassment, guilt, and humiliation. However, there are nuanced differences between these. While these differences may seem small, they can make a big difference in how we think about them, which affects our feelings of self-worth. The way we feel, in general, is often based heavily on the way we think about ourselves and our emotional state. When we feel negative emotions, this can affect us the most. This is why it is important to know that there is a difference between doing a bad thing and being a bad person. When we do something bad, we often feel ashamed of ourselves. The feeling of shame attacks our self-worth. Sometimes we use shame as a way to rationalize or make excuses for our bad and poor behavior. Doing this doesn't help the situation no matter what the situation is. Instead, if we have done something that makes us feel ashamed, it's best to simply apologize. The feeling of guilt can be just as powerful as the feeling of shame. However, shame only brings about negative consequences. Sometimes people think shame can be used as a tool for keeping people in line. However, this is a terrible way of thinking. Brown writes, Shame is highly correlated with addiction, violence, aggression, depression, eating disorders, and bullying. It's not correlated with anything positive. What's even worse is that when we feel ashamed, we are more likely to act out in a negative way which can sometimes hurt others physically or emotionally. Guilt, on the other hand, can have a positive effect by encouraging us to change our actions or to make amends. Humiliation is also unique from shame. Brown explains the difference between these two feelings simply. People often feel like shame is deserved, but humiliation is just something that happens to people whether they earn it or not. However, if humiliation builds up and is left unchecked, it can lead to feelings of shame. When humiliation doesn't get the chance to build up, when the emotions are dealt with in a positive manner, the feelings should fade on their own. Embarrassment is similar to humiliation, but still distinct. Embarrassment fades much faster than humiliation. This is because it is usually caused by something minor that others have been through and can therefore easily relate to it. Since this feeling fades so quickly, it does not get the chance to define us or the way we think about ourselves. What can we do about shame? As mentioned previously, we can learn to be resilient to shame, but we cannot be resistant to it. Becoming resilient to shame takes practice. 
Through her research, Brown has discovered that people who are resilient to shame have four basic things in common, which are listed here. They know what triggers their shame and how they feel when they are ashamed. They practice self-awareness. They reach out to others when they are in need. They talk about their shame, no matter how uncomfortable it may be. Once we become resilient to shame, we naturally allow ourselves to feel more connected to others. This involves a great deal of critical thinking and a healthy balance of emotion and logic to accomplish. Brown writes that there are three basic ways that people deal with shame when they are not resilient to it. These include withdrawing from others, trying to please others without pleasing themselves, and becoming aggressive towards others. None of these methods are particularly helpful. Here are some of the best ways Brown suggests we try to manage shame. Practice courage by reaching out to ask for help when you need it. Talk yourself down when you are overwhelmed by feelings of shame. Own your own narrative. Don't let others tell your story. Talk to people who are empathetic. Sometimes we feel ashamed and want to hide away from the world. But talking about your problems may show that they don't seem as serious once you say them out loud. If nothing else, empathetic people can comfort you when you are feeling ashamed or otherwise unwell. Men, Women, and Shame In general, men are less likely than women to open up and talk about their feelings of shame. However, both men and women are equally affected by feelings of shame. The difference is that different things trigger shame for men and women. Women and shame. Women often get caught up with thinking that they should be one way or another. This is most likely influenced by traditional gender roles. Some of the most common areas that cause women to feel ashamed are their looks, motherhood, love and marriage, and general feelings of perfectionism. Luckily, Brown outlines a few things women can do to combat their feelings of shame. These include being honest with yourself and others, balancing emotions, not being afraid to say what you're thinking, so long as it is not cruel, and remembering that no one is perfect. Men and Shame Similar to women's shame, most often coming from traditional gender roles, Many men feel shame because of the role that toxic masculinity plays in their lives. Some of the most common causes of shame for men include failure at work, parenting difficulties, failure to satisfy romantic partners, being wrong, being criticized, and being told they are soft or weak. Sadly, many men don't have the tools necessary to deal with shame in a healthy way. Because of this, many men deal with shame by fighting, giving up, or getting high to avoid their shame. Fight or flight. More often than not, when men feel ashamed, they either become angry and take their negative emotions out on others, or they shut down and refuse to talk about their feelings. The only way for men to overcome this is to realize that they are allowed to embrace their emotions even negative ones like fear and shame. Self-compassion Both men and women need to work on self-compassion if they want to become resilient to shame and live wholehearted lives. How we treat ourselves often correlates with how we treat others. People who are cruel to themselves are often cruel to others. We judge people for things that we are self-conscious about. Needless to say, this doesn't help anyone. Children who grow up with parents with low self-esteem or who take out their negative emotions on others are more likely to bully others. Children who are raised by empathetic parents are more likely to be empathetic themselves. Body image. Body image is one of the largest factors that impact self-esteem in both men and women. This can spawn from shame related to not being blank enough or feeling unworthy of being loved. Brown reminds her readers that people don't need to do anything to be loved. Also, as for sex, if someone wants to have sex with you, then it is likely that they are already attracted to you. People need trust and intimacy in a romantic relationship to feel loved. Being loved can help us improve our feelings of worthiness and our confidence regarding our body image. Watch what you say. When you say something cruel, it sticks in someone's head. 
You can apologize all you want, but that doesn't mean the person will forget what you said. Criticism sticks in a person's heart and mind for years. When it comes to these situations, it's best to stick to the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. If you're not great at self-compassion yet, treat others better than you would treat yourself. This kind of vulnerability will work wonders for building trust. Be real. Both men and women need to embrace their real selves. It's best to ignore the confines of toxic masculinity and femininity. While it's okay to feel masculine or feminine, no one should let gender roles tell them how they are supposed to live their lives or present themselves to others. By embracing our true selves, we become more vulnerable, but also more authentic. Avoiding foreboding joy and oversharing. Near the beginning of this chapter, Brown writes, Vulnerability is the last thing I want you to see in me, but the first thing I look for in you. This sets the tone for this whole chapter. We wear metaphorical armor to protect ourselves and to hide our true selves to the rest of the world. We do this as a way to avoid vulnerability, whether we do it consciously or not. Believe it or not, most people share a couple of the same pieces of armor and coping mechanisms. You are enough. As previously discussed throughout this book, people don't need to do anything in particular to be worthy of love. We are all worthy of love. However, many people struggle with feeling worthy of love or like they are otherwise not good enough. This feeling is often caused by artificial scarcity. Once we reject this scarcity and embrace our vulnerability, we can begin to live wholeheartedly. Here are three mantras to keep in mind when you are feeling unworthy. 1. I am blank enough. 2. I have had enough of feeling blank. Three, letting myself be seen is enough. Foreboding joy. People sometimes find it difficult to feel joyful because it takes some amount of vulnerability. Brown refers to the fear of being joyful or being too happy as foreboding joy. Brown mentions that in a world where scarcity is so abundant, It can be scary to feel joyful or to be hopeful about feeling joyful in the future. Sometimes, when people become joyful, they immediately worry about what could go wrong. Imagining the worst-case scenario for something is a common symptom of this. It is as though if something good happens, then something bad must happen to balance it out. Of course, this isn't really true. By fearing and preparing for the worst, some people may think that they are doing all they can to know how to react if a worst-case scenario were to happen. However, preparing for the worst doesn't mean that you will actually be able to handle a worst-case scenario well. All preparing for the worst guarantees is that you will be anxious. Brown calls this practice rehearsing tragedy. With this practice, people sacrifice joy in the present in hopes of having less pain in the future. But this usually does more harm than good, as far as one's mental state is concerned. Putting gratitude into practice. Scarcity and fear are the biggest drivers of foreboding joy. Feeling this way is damaging to one's sense of worthiness and makes it difficult to live a wholehearted life. When we feel anxious during moments of joy, we have the perfect opportunity to practice gratitude, being thankful for what we have. Brown insists that gratitude is the best cure for foreboding joy. Another way to combat foreboding joy is to talk to someone about your worries. It's best to talk to empathetic people, as they are the ones who are most likely to be able to make you feel better. Doing this is much better than lying about your feelings or making excuses when your negative feelings cause you to perform negative actions. Here are three more things Brown wants readers to keep in mind regarding joy. Joy can occur even in ordinary moments. It is important to be thankful for what you have. Enjoy your joy while you are experiencing it. Perfectionism As discussed earlier in this summary, Brown believes that perfectionism is detrimental to one's goal of living a wholehearted life. 
Again, she reminds her readers that no one is perfect. Getting caught up on trying to be perfect will only cause stress and anxiety. Remember, being good enough really is good enough. Appreciate life's imperfections. Recovering perfectionists may find it difficult to appreciate imperfections in themselves. Brown's advice to deal with this is to treat yourself as you would treat others. Generally, try to be kind to yourself. Another important thing to keep in mind is that we all make mistakes. No one is perfect. Because of this, you are not alone when you feel bad for messing something up or otherwise making a mistake or a poor decision. Whenever possible, be mindful of your emotional state. If you are becoming anxious about something, ask yourself if the emotions are realistic for the situation. At the same time, allow yourself to feel joy or pain when it makes sense. You don't have to cut yourself off from emotions entirely to be mindful of your feelings. Above all, no matter what your emotional state, remember that you are worthy of love. Numbing Numbing your emotions is one way many people try to avoid feeling vulnerable. One of the most common ways people numb themselves to their emotions is simply by staying busy. Sometimes people may even feel like they are addicted to being busy because they use it as an excuse for avoiding vulnerability. What many people don't realize is that by numbing negative emotions on purpose or subconsciously, they are also numbing positive emotions. There are a variety of ways people consciously and subconsciously numb themselves from their emotions. There are the obvious ways of numbing, abusing drugs and alcohol, but isolating yourself from others is another very dangerous form of numbing. Numbing by avoiding others is perhaps one of the most dangerous forms of numbing, as far as living wholeheartedly is concerned, as it makes us feel disconnected from others. This can lead to intrusive thoughts, such as thinking, if we were blank enough, then we wouldn't get upset so easily, or generally thinking that we aren't worthy of love. Setting Comfortable Boundaries Numbing emotions is one of humanity's many horrible coping mechanisms. Luckily, Brown has some suggestions on how to avoid numbing and other negative coping mechanisms. Learn how to actively feel your emotions. Be mindful of what numbing coping mechanisms you have and when you use them. Learn how to deal with negative emotions, feeling negative emotions, without succumbing to numbing. Learn how to set boundaries for yourself. Sometimes, once people recognize the triggers that cause them to use numbing as a coping mechanism, they try to avoid the trigger altogether. While this is one method for dealing with triggers, it is not always effective. After all, you can't guarantee that you can avoid a trigger entirely. Instead, it's much more helpful to learn how to act once you are triggered. Setting boundaries with yourself and others can help to boost your feeling of worthiness. This works by helping you feel more connected to others, which helps to fight numbing as well. Brown writes, Connection is the energy that is created between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment. Find people who make you feel accepted and who you can talk to about your insecurities and troubles. Showing your vulnerable side to empathetic people will help to improve your sense of belonging. Care for your spirit. Another coping mechanism people commonly use are shadow comforts. Brown defines the shadow comforts as things people try to do to make themselves feel better, but that usually don't have much of an effect. One example of this is binge drinking or eating. However, what matters more than what shadow comforts we have is why we have these shadow comforts and when we use them. Do you use shadow comforts when you are stressed or numb to emotions? Ask yourself this the next time you find yourself indulging in shadow comforts. Brown suggests that her readers embrace spirituality as a healthy coping mechanism. Spirituality doesn't necessarily equal religion. Brown defines spirituality as the deeply held belief that we are inextricably connected to one another by a force greater than ourselves. By keeping this in mind and embracing spirituality, we can live wholehearted lives. Other Common Coping Mechanisms 
Playing the victim or the Viking, hero, are common coping mechanisms. While the victim is self-explanatory, Brown explains that playing the Viking involves fighting with others to avoid becoming a victim. Whether a person is a Viking, victim, or neither is mainly based on how they were raised. Both of these are examples of negative black-and-white thinking. In general, black-and-white thinking is a bad way to look at the world, as it doesn't allow us to see the many gray areas in life. Seeking support. Whether a person is a Viking or a victim, one of the best things they can do to change this is to seek support from others. Reaching out shows vulnerability, but it is also the easiest way to receive empathy to commence emotional healing. Know what a successful healing session looks like and feels like to you. Only then can you know if you are making progress. How Trauma Impacts Daring Greatly While not everyone has trauma, more people than we think have some amount of trauma. What your trauma is does not matter as much as how greatly you let it affect your life. Do not let your trauma define you. This is incompatible with living wholeheartedly. People who want to live a wholehearted life will do well to acknowledge their problems instead of ignoring them. Seek help and support from others when they need it. Practice working through their shame and practice being more vulnerable to those they trust. With enough practice, these actions can become second nature and wholehearted living can commence. Oversharing According to Brown, there are two basic types of oversharing. These include floodlighting and smash and grab. Floodlighting involves telling people things to make yourself feel better. Usually, this also involves telling them things that are very personal and waiting to see their reaction as a test of trust and friendship. However, the floodlighter usually does this with people who they do not fully trust, making this an overall bad idea. This test rarely goes over well. People who are put in the position of talking with someone who is floodlighting often do not take this well, which can make the floodlighter feel insecure. It should be noted that sometimes people overshare without even knowing it. This can happen when they blurt out information. This is especially common in people who are bad at keeping secrets. While it is common to feel ashamed after doing this, remember to practice self-compassion. If you are ever worried that you are floodlighting, there are a few questions you can ask yourself. One, why am I telling someone this? Two, am I looking for a specific outcome or reaction or attention? Three, how do I feel when I share with this person? Smash and grab, unlike floodlighting, is all about using oversharing to consciously or unconsciously manipulate others. This is usually done to get attention or to try to make people feel sympathetic to you. People do not always use smash and grab to hurt others, but instead to get validation that they are worthy of love. However, that may involve some guilt tripping, which is anything but healthy in any kind of relationship. Serpentining Another commonly used coping mechanism is serpentining. This involves doing whatever it takes to dodge feelings of intimacy, joy, and other positive or negative emotions. This defense mechanism is used to avoid showing or feeling vulnerability. The best way to avoid serpentining is by being mindful and present of your emotions. Brown says specifically, be present, pay attention, and move forward. Cynicism Brown writes, Cynicism, criticism, cruelty, and cool can be fashioned into weapons. Using cynicism or any of the other four C's as a coping mechanism is dangerous, as this way of coping is likely to hurt others. Some people use these coping mechanisms as a way to hurt others, on purpose, who are willing to show their vulnerability. However, others use these coping mechanisms as a way to avoid their own vulnerability. It should also be noted here that criticism and constructive criticism are two different things. Also, Brown defines cool in this sense as thinking you are too cool or above something so much that you cannot be bothered with it. Check yourself. It is always important to open yourself up to constructive criticism. By listening to these remarks, you can learn to better yourself.
However, only take criticism from those you can trust and you know want you to have the best in life. Don't take criticism from those you cannot trust and who may just criticize you to hurt your feelings. Brown writes, Only accept and pay attention to feedback from people who are also in the arena. Also, remember that some people are cruel to others, not always because they actually dislike someone else, but because insulting them makes them feel better about themselves. This isn't an excuse for their actions, but it can serve as a reminder to the insulted that there is nothing wrong with them. Overall, we need to decide whose opinions matter to us and whose don't. Know yourself. The focus of Chapter 5 is all about something Brown calls minding the gap. This has everything to do with knowing where you are in life, where you want to be, and how you plan to get there. Strategy and culture. To begin, we need to define strategy and culture. In its most simple terms, strategy is your game plan for life. Culture is who we are. These two things need to find a way to work together if we are ever to accomplish our goals. Disengagement. Brown personally believes that disengagement is the root of many problems. She writes, We disengage to protect ourselves from vulnerability, shame, and feeling lost and without purpose. We also disengage when we feel like the people who are leading us aren't living up to their end of the social contract. The people who are leading us in this context are most often politicians or religious leaders, like pastors. Most often, people don't disengage with life on purpose. Instead, Brown suggests that disengagement happens when we realize that we can't give people what we don't have. Another common cause of disengagement comes in cases when our values contradict each other. Brown calls this the value gap and defines it as the place between our practiced values and our aspirational values. Some examples of values that should work together but sometimes take some work to work together are listed here. Honesty and integrity, gratitude and respect, emotional connection and honored feelings, respect and accountability, setting limits and personal boundaries. All in all, people need to learn that in order to be resilient to shame, we need to open ourselves up to vulnerability. At the same time, we must continue to make sure to mind the gap, ensuring our goals and values line up with each other. By doing these things, we can move toward living wholeheartedly. Shame Culture at Work and School If we are to live wholeheartedly, we need to rehumanize the way we look at work and education. Realizing that not everything is automated and emotionless, and not every worker or student works or learns in the same way, are things we can do to move in the right direction. Leadership Brown defines a leader as anyone who holds her or himself accountable for finding potential for people and processes. Even if you are not a boss, manager, or top of your class, you can still be a leader according to Brown's definition. While we may have what it takes to be a leader, acting as a leader can be anxiety-inducing at first. This is, in part, because many people are afraid to share their creative ideas or do anything in line with the status quo in fear of being mocked. Brown writes, No corporation or school can thrive in the absence of creativity, innovation, and learning, and the greatest threat for all three of these is disengagement. For this reason, schools and businesses would do well to encourage, rather than mock, creativity. Rehumanizing the workplace and schools help with this because it reminds us that workers and students are unique individuals, not just cogs in a machine. Combating Shame Triggers Scarcity and disengagement not only fuel each other, but also shame. Before we can combat our shame, we need to know what triggers it. From there, we can learn ways to avoid our triggers when possible and deal with the triggers in healthy ways when they are unavoidable. Shame and Culture Sometimes, cultures can become saturated with shame, which can make it almost impossible to avoid. Brown writes, Blaming, gossiping, favoritism, name-calling, and harassment are all behavioral clues that shame has permeated a culture. 
These negative behavioral clues are most noticeable when people in positions of power use them. Whether the higher-ups want to admit it or not, every school and workplace has some level of shame culture, both internalized and externalized. Sometimes, ineffective and cruel managers and teachers will try to use shame as a way to keep people in line. Not only is this rude, but it also works to discourage creativity, learning, engagement, and general productivity, which is the opposite effect managers and teachers would hope for. Shame, Brown writes, can only rise so far in any system before people disengage to protect themselves. When we are disengaged, we don't show up, we don't contribute, and we stop caring. In turn, people who feel ashamed and disengaged may use feeling this way as an excuse to insult or exhibit otherwise poor behavior, both at work and in their personal lives. This can include cheating, lying, and stealing. This can lead to a vicious cycle in which colleagues and students are made to feel ashamed and disengaged, so they then exhibit behavior that makes others feel ashamed and disengaged. Blame Blame and shame are closely related, both in and outside of schools and businesses. When something goes wrong, whether it is an accident or done on purpose, blame makes us feel like someone needs to be held accountable, whether or not it will help the situation. However, this often does more harm than good, as the blamed person will likely be overcome with shame afterward. Covering it up Covering it up is another terrible management tool used to keep people in line. Usually, covering it up is meant to keep people quiet and protect someone else's reputation or ego. However, this only adds to a shame culture. Luckily, Brown has what she calls the five best strategies for building shame-resistant organizations. These strategies are listed here. 1. Support leaders who use kind management tools. 2. Try to find out where the shame is coming from or who is using shame-inducing management tools. 3. Have clear expectations. 4. Learn the difference between shame and guilt. 5. Learn how to give helpful feedback. Feedback Near the beginning of this section, Brown opened by writing, A daring greatly culture is a culture of honest, constructive, and engaged feedback. Without any feedback, negative or positive, people are more likely to become disengaged. Positive feedback encourages people to continue doing their best. Feedback on things tells people what they need to work on, and this can create clear expectations and goals. The two biggest issues concerning feedback are that people are generally uncomfortable giving feedback, especially negative feedback, and people don't know how to receive feedback well. The best remedy to both of these issues is to simply practice giving and receiving feedback more often. At first, this will likely be uncomfortable, but that's okay. Always try to keep your strengths in mind. By giving and getting feedback, people can more easily move forward, both emotionally and professionally. Meet people at their level. Meeting people where they are and talking to them at their level, avoiding talking down to them, can make them feel more comfortable, which also makes them more impressionable to feedback. Courage and vulnerability. Honesty is key to progress and trust in the workplace, at school, and at home. It takes a great deal of both honesty and courage to admit when you are wrong or when you don't know something. People should learn how to act in a positive way when they win or lose, and how to clean up or fix something when they cause a problem. Before we can succeed at work or school, we must first embrace uncertainty. Some of the best leaders are vulnerable. With leadership comes extra pressure to succeed. By embracing the unknown and our own uncertainty, we can move past this and become great leaders ourselves. Parenting and Vulnerability Near the beginning of Chapter 7, Brown writes something all parents can relate to. The uncertainty of parenting can bring up feelings in us ranging from frustration to terror. These feelings most often come from noticing that other people parent differently than you do. Different styles of parenting are not an attack on your style. 
It's not likely that one style is better or worse than another. They are just different. The truth is that most parents feel vulnerable at one point or another. This is caused by many things, including self-doubt, comparing yourself to others, and trying to be perfect. If parents want to raise wholehearted children, they must drop this way of thinking. Instead, Brown has several suggestions on things parents can do to influence their children to live wholeheartedly. Be engaging. Be loving and compassionate. Be authentic. Know you are worthy of love. Embrace vulnerability, your own and your children's. Praise hard work and virtuous actions. Be courageous. Be resilient to shame. If parents expect their children to respect themselves, they need to set a good example for them regarding living wholeheartedly. Doing any or all of the things above is a step in the right direction. Shame and Parenting Parents who genuinely believe they are worthy of love are more likely to raise children who also have high self-worth. These types of parents make it clear that their children do not need to do anything to be worthy of love. They just are. In a healthy family environment, there should be no prerequisites for deserving love. One tip Brown suggests is that parents show love before giving criticism. One example of this comes when a child fails a test at school. To show love, a parent can show compassion with a smile or a hug and letting their children know that they tried their best. Then, move on to giving constructive criticism, such as encouraging their child to study more next time or offering to help with studying. Another tip is for parents to work on separating who their children are from what their children do. This will teach children that just because they do one bad thing, it doesn't mean they are a bad person. An example of this is knowing the difference between a child lying once and being a liar. Parents would also do well to raise their children in an environment in which they are not ashamed to share their thoughts and feelings. One way to do this is to teach children about the idea of normalizing, meaning that many people go through the same things. This helps to show children that they are not alone. Brown notes that it is never too late to try to connect or reconnect with your children. With the tactics listed, parents can even encourage their adult children to share their thoughts and feelings without being ashamed. Support other parents. As discussed previously in this book, just because someone parents differently than you doesn't mean they are parenting incorrectly. Instead of criticizing parents for raising their children differently, try to be supportive. Of course, the exception to this is in all cases of abuse, which should be called out and reported to the police or CPS immediately. Love and Belonging Children should always know that they belong to their family, even if they may not always seem like they fit in. To fit in, people need to be similar and sometimes change aspects of themselves. People don't need to do anything to belong. Parents should let their children know that their belonging to their family is unconditional always. This will help children to gain a sense of worth and empathy. Parenting and vulnerability. Yes, parenting is vulnerable. Even attempting to parent is one of the bravest things a person can do. When you feel overwhelmed, try to find some hope. Brown writes, Hope is a combination of setting goals, having the tenacity and perseverance to pursue them, and believing in our own abilities. Brown believes hope is a learned state of mind that takes practice to achieve on a regular basis. She also believes we are most likely to feel hopeful when we set realistic goals, make a plan to accomplish our goals, and believe that we can do anything we set our minds to. Parents who do their best to remain hopeful are more likely to raise children who are also full of hope. Whether it seems like it or not, children are also watching and learning from their parents, which is part of the reason it is so important for parents to live wholehearted lives. Brene Brown has crafted this wonderful self-help book to encourage all of her readers to throw aside their shame and embrace vulnerability. By opening up to others and talking to empathetic people, we can begin to feel more engaged in our interpersonal relationships. Furthermore, Becoming more invested in our work or school, 
by acting as a leader or adding more creativity into our projects can also fight off disengagement. Once we are truly engaged with the world around us, it becomes much easier to live life wholeheartedly and to dare greatly.